right, at the sounding of the chime, we'll open this uh, special meeting of the Carville City Council on Tuesday, March the 20th at 10 a.m. Uh, item number one is update regarding the city's development services, operations, and services. And it looks like Drew will begin us this morning. And I know this is another in a series of workshops that Mr. McDaniel has arranged for council to go a little deeper into some of the things we want to um, organize and understand having to do with the city government operations. So thank you for it's organizing. That's correct. Drew Paxton, the Executive Director of Development Services, and Guillermo Garcia, uh, Executive Director of our Strategic Initiative. Say that really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> for strategic initiatives, okay. Looking at <coughs> development services, uh, purposes and the services that we offer. Our purpose, development services, we believe that the citizens of Kerrville should have a superior quality of life and a vibrant, sustainable community. How we do this is through the consistent application of codes and ordinances and a coordinated development process. And what we do through our major services, being building services, code enforcement, environmental health, and planning and zoning, and those support services, as you can see in that table below. Recently put together a stakeholder group, uh, taking individuals from the building and development community for an open discussion on the issues of development services. And to identify those requirements, we broke out the process into three broad pieces, development review, plan review, and inspections. Drew, I'm sorry, but weren't you going to cover that page four in, in any level of detail or questioning? Did any members of council, uh, on the planning and zoning, that was just interesting to me, that column, the yes. duties and responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, because I know I uh, addressed planning and zoning about a year ago or more about some of these um, responsibilities, if you will, and so are you more proactive in the area of, um, let's say, redevelopments and that sort of thing? Are there healthy discussions that you have planned from time to time about uh, annexation, that's number three, those kinds of things? Because generally it's been as the um, applications come, they're considered, but is there a little more um, advice for us on how that could be utilized? A lot of those proactive planning projects will come out of the comprehensive plan. Um, a lot of the recent projects that we've been working on, as you mentioned, have been come in, you know, projects come in the door and start working on. We've got someone geared up to do their project, their property. Um, as far as the future planning, uh, that'll, again, that'll come from the comprehensive plan. Under uh, planning and zoning, you have customer service. How does that fit in to what they do? Just work, I mean, it fit, really fits in with all four departments, um, working with the customers, whether it's a developer, um, business owner, or a citizen, and how each of these departments kind of touch those parts of the community. So again, the stakeholder group looked at our processes in three broad categories, the development review, the plan review and permitting, and then the inspection process. So one of the things that we did as we brought those stakeholders together is we used a tool. It's called the Kano Analysis. Uh, it's a tool that we use in Lean Six Sigma, and it's a tool that's used to understand uh, the voice of the customer. It's basically trying to understand what the requirements are, and then from there prioritize those requirements so that we can then develop a plan to implement or address those requirements uh, to increase our customer service to the organizations that we're trying to impact. And then again, it was developed by... Uh, Noriaki Kano. It was developed in the early 80s uh, while he was working in, in I believe it was uh, the automotive industry. I just can't remember which automotive group that he was actually with. And uh, so the Kano model itself, what it's designed to do is to look at three types of attributes. These attributes are the must-haves. These are basically the, the, the basic processes that we need to be very successful at. Okay, And it's the things that you know, when you look at something and you look at a different process, it's like well, this is what it should have. Think of a hotel. When you go to a hotel, it's like, I expect the bed to be there. So that's the be the must have. And then you have the performance or the more is better. These are the processes that if we did these processes a little bit better, it would increase the customer satisfaction. 
And then, of course, you have the last element, which is the wow factor, or as Drew calls it, the knock your socks off factor. These are the things that just really blow you away. And so these are the three things that we, as when we got into the uh, uh, stakeholder meeting, is what we asked our group to discuss. And so this is just the Kano model in itself, uh, just to give you a, a visual picture of what it's trying to look like uh, try, once we have all the data together and what it looks like. And so you have the, the excellent attributes or the excitement attributes. Those are the corners where if you have really high satisfaction and you have fully good implemented, it'll go up to that level. And those will be the things that are the wow factors. Those are the things that we need to work towards. It doesn't mean we can accomplish everything, but we work towards those things. And then you have the performance attributes. Those are the, the more is better. And then the blue line represents the must be's. Those are the things that we need to be really good at. So in, in order to conduct this exercise, well, instead of having like your traditional town hall meeting where we sit up front, we gather information from the group itself, what we ended up doing is having more of a workshop. And so we split the team that came together. Uh, we had approximately 14 individuals show up. And so we split the team into three major, three big groups. And then each of these groups were us given a topic. And so the topics that we discussed, as mentioned before, were the, the, the development review, the plan review, and the inspection. And so each group would have, a, have one of those items to discuss. They would discuss amongst themselves for about approximately 10 minutes. And then we would rotate out the subjects uh, until we were completely done. And then at the end, we had an open discussion about the major items that they identified through their individual workshop. Uh, and so that led to really good discussion. We got really good feedback from the group. And so from that information, identifying the requirements, this is the, we identified 20 high level requirements that the group said, this is what's important to us. These are the things that we really would like to get addressed. From that, these 20, we ended up sending a survey because part of the Kano analysis is not just looking at, oh, what are your requirements, but also trying to prioritize those requirements. And so what we ended up doing was sending out a survey to the group, and it's a positive and negative survey. So you're asking one question in, in, in this example, uh, if I may. It says, if we establish consistency among all, all staff, how would that make you feel? And then you have your five uh, your responses that you have for each of those questions. And then the negative, if we can't establish a consistency of all staff, how would that make you feel? So it's a positive and negative. You're trying to get a, a feeling of, yes, this is acceptable, or you know what, eh, I'm not too worried about that. That doesn't impact me so much. And so once we've got those responses, this is the final tally that we were able to get. And so what you see, we've broken them up into the items that were identified as excitement, the items that were identified as more is better, and then the must, and then there was one item that came out as indifferent. In other words, people couldn't decide if it was it really that important to them. So it came an item that was like classified as indifferent. And so uh, I'm not going to go through each one of those, but just to give you an example, one of the, mo one of the excitements is the inspector to provide digital feedback, uh, the more is better, uh, high level of customer service at all levels. And then one of the must-haves must is provide timeliness in the process, uh, timeliness in response to the process. Can, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Go, um, so on that one, one in particular, the number 20, that's all staff members are prepared before DRC. Mm -hmm. how, how do you end up choosing that's an excitement instead of a must-have if it's 333? Well, on that case, what I ended up doing was uh, I looked at the, the actual ratio because it, it's a, it's a formula that's there and then so I, right now you're not seeing the rounded portion so I just went with the ratio that's a little bit higher and okay. so that's why I, I put it as a excitement. Okay. So when you put it, uh, all the, the items in the graph this is what it looks like uh, so that you can see the full Kano analysis so that you can see where it falls on, on the graph itself and so when you look at the calculations themselves the items that are in red so the items that are in red are attributes if they're not deployed properly will increase dissatisfaction, okay? So we have to be really conscious about if we're approaching or we're deploying something along that manner. So we look at number one. Number one is consistency among staff. And if we don't deploy that properly, then we'll have a lot of dissatisfaction, which is something that we're already getting back anyways. And then the items are in green. If that we succeed on implementing that particular requirement, then it will definitely increase the overall customer satisfaction for the organization. So we have to look at a balance of it and see, okay, how are we going to implement and improve the process overall? So to elaborate a little bit further about some of the activities that we're doing, 
is we have a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt project, which actually Trina is the leader of this project. Uh, her, pro her project is to look at the plan review process. This is only a subsection, but it has a lot of impact on all the other aspects of development services. So part of the Lean Six Sigma process is we go through define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And so part of the define phase is gathering information to understand what kind of issue are we have. So in this case, when we connect, collected the initial data, what we found that the overall average, again, this is the average, the overall average of plan review is 6.32 days. Uh, but that does not mean that we consistently meet that average, right? There's a variation that's included. So if you look at the standard deviation number, it's almost four. So basically what that means, we have widespread of variation in the process. So in some instances, we can have a minimum of one day review time all the way to 11 days uh, on this, according to this data, a maximum that we have in that small sampling that we've got. Uh, so what that means is there's a lot of opportunity for improvement because ultimately one of the goals of Lean Six Sigma is to reduce variation in a process. And so this is a great example of variation that we're trying to reduce and eliminate in a process. Is it, is, yes, sir. You, so if I'm looking at that bar graph, is that, is that telling us that while the average is at six, the bulk of them are either really fast or really long yes. based on those bars? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's no, for, I guess, to, to just to simplify, there's really not consistency. It's either, like you said, really fast or really slow. It's, okay. it's neither uh, right in the middle. So once we collected the enough information, I'm sorry, I skipped the slide. Once we connected enough information, we were able to create a problem statement. So the problem statement that we identified for this particular project is that the magnitude of the problem is that uh, we have a 45% defect rate and the expected performance is exceeding eight days internal requirement. So what that means is we went back and we looked at all our data and we used uh, capability analysis, which we don't have in here, but that capability analysis indicated to us that overall 45% of the plans that are reviewed do not fall within the expected eight days. So there's a lot of variation that happens in this process. Even though our average is six, there's still a lot of uh, defects that are occurring outside of the eight-day time frame internally. Because externally, we have a 10-day time frame. So we're trying to get all the plans reviewed by 10 days, but internally, we're trying to get them done by eight. So part of the process, and this is now getting into the measure phase, part of the process is looking at the process itself. And so what we did is we went through and created a process map as you can see here, if we break down this process map, you can see there is a lot of steps. I know it's very hard to see, but it, there's a lot of steps. Uh, last count, I think we had, what, 32? 32 steps in this process. And there's a lot of redundancy to it. And so in this next slide, you can see where we've highlighted in yellow, these are the opportunities for improvement and also the elimination of some of the redundancies that are occurring in the process. So a lot of touching of this process uh, along the way. So part of our analysis, too, is we went through and said, okay, well, how long does it really take us? Because we know on a date time frame how long it's taking us, but how much time is actually being implemented in, in doing this review? And so we broke it down into uh, six, five, uh, sorry, five basic elements, in-processing, prepared distribution, the plan review actually itself, the reconciling of information in the final processing. And so the in-processing, for example, takes about 18 minutes uh, to conduct. And that's basically when an individual comes into, the, into development services, fills out an application, fills out all the proper paperwork uh, to, to get the application or the requests submitted. Then you have the prepare the distribution. This is where Marianne, at this time, is collecting all the documents. She's scanning. She's making copies. Uh, she's ready to walk it out to the departments. And so she'll go through the office, I'll show you a spaghetti diagram of that right now, and she'll call development, uh, not, I'm sorry, not development, sorry. she'll call the fire department to come get the copies and a whole bunch of other things that she's doing. But that usually takes uh, roughly about 68 minutes to conduct. And then the plan review process takes about 66 minutes. And then the reconciling of information takes about 29 minutes. This is basically where she's collecting all the data, all the information from everybody. And then the final processing is the actual communication and getting the individual to come in, pay their, uh, their fees, and issue out the certificate. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, assuming that these people are all in-house at the mm -hmm. time, right? Because yes. some of the 
of calls we've had is that, well, this can't happen because so-and-so's on vacation, or, you know, what, what do we have for that kind of situation? So the, from a contingency standpoint on the back end, that's something that we've talked about briefly, uh, not too in depth, but the idea is that with the, the proposals and the improvements that we're going to have, uh, we're looking to make this a little bit more systematic, and then you also have different layers of support staff that can do some of these functions for them. Um, right now, it's all paper, and if it goes into an office and the office is locked, it stays there, and nobody has access to it. So but that did come up in the discussions. Mm -hmm. Good. But that's like the difference between two sorts of analysis. Like what you're showing us here is average time to actually complete the thing. Mm -hmm. What she's asking about is more like elapsed time to get something done. Does right. Well, well right. the way I understood it was more if you have, like, let's say, uh, Sabina, for example. Yeah. If she's out of office, is there someone else to actually right. conduct that, right. that, that analysis? Right. That's the way I understood the question. That's correct. Okay. So overall, uh, as you can see, the total time, the cycle time it takes to conduct the analysis is 205 minutes or roughly 3.4 hours to conduct the analysis. So that gives you a big picture of when you look at lead time, lead time, as we saw before in the other slide before, it's taking about six days on average. But the actual cycle time or work time is about three hours to actually conduct. So the work is being conducted over time. And again, the, the, the thing that we have to remember is that people are not just doing that specific role all the time. They have other functions, other job duties. So they try to prioritize it as they go throughout the days uh, to get the, the, the work complete. The tack time here, this tack time analysis, let me briefly uh, explain what tack time is. Tack time is the rhythm of the process. Okay, it's, basic, it's based on demand and the time available that you have to do these inspections. And so in this case, where we looked at it, uh, we did uh, 480 minutes, which is roughly 228, uh, 28, 800 seconds or an eight-hour day. And within that time frame, you can see that our attack time is roughly about uh, four hours, almost th actually three, roughly about four hours. And what ends up happening, when you look at this slide here, the individual cycle times are listed below in the bar graphs themselves. And so you can see the gap between that and the tack time is represented in the sense of capability, capacity. So we have enough capacity to meet the demand. It's just a matter of now figuring out how we're prioritizing and conducting the actual work. So that's something that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes as well. Guillermo, you might elaborate more on how do you capture the, the tack time? So tag time is based on demand, and so one of the things that we did is we went out and looked at an entire year's worth of information and figured out, okay, on average, we're, we're processing approximately 400 uh, plus uh, plants. And matter of fact, I can give you that number exactly. Uh, we're processing 480 plants per day, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not 480. We're processing, do you remember the number 440? Yeah, it was 440, 440, 440 plants per year, which if you do the math, it breaks down to two plants per day. And so from that standpoint, divided by the time available, that's how you calculate tack time. It's a basic uh, formula. Uh, it's used in, in multiple industries, just trying to get a gauge as to how many resources you need, how much time you have available to actually complete the job that you're being assigned. And then from there, you can start making adjustments based on demand whether you increase capacity or you decrease capacity in, in a workspace. So there's a lot of things that come, come into it as well. So on this slide here, one of the things that we, we got interested in is we took a snapshot. Okay, This is a snapshot in time. And what we were trying to do is figure out well, how much inventory is sitting in the process. And so when you look at this, the first Pareto chart that you have here on the left shows that in engineering had eight plans <coughs> sitting in inventory. You had fire with five, building inspection at two, planning at two, and then public works with two. So what that means is at any given time, there's a number of inventory that sits in process. In this case, in our snapshot, engineering was sitting on eight individual plans. Now, when we looked at it and said, okay, well, how much days is that inventory sitting there? You can see that even though planning, for example, has only two uh, plan review sitting on their desk that's been sitting there for eight days. Okay, And so we were trying to see, okay, well, is there anything that's sitting there? 
why are we waiting on the, the plans to be reviewed? Can we not re start reviewing these plans a lot earlier? So those are the questions that came that were generated from this uh, review. Because you can see from this example, it seems that we're waiting till the eighth day to actually conduct the review. So additional process analysis that we did is that this is the spaghetti diagram that I, ta I mentioned earlier. And the cool thing about a spaghetti diagram is that it allows you to see all the motion that exists in a process. And so you can see the starting point is that first uh, little office in the corner on the left hand corner. This is where Mary Ann sits. And then once she gets up to actually process and start delivering the, the, uh, the, the plan reviews or the plans themselves, you can see all the walking that she's doing. And so when we calculated that out, we actually took uh, account of how many steps. Uh, that's about 105 steps. It takes her about a minute to do because everything's in close proximity. But if you looked at it over the course of a year, you're talking about 27,300 steps. You're talking about five hours in time over the course of a year. And she's walking approximately 13 miles in a given year. Yeah, just as a suggestion, next time you present this, it'd be really cool if you could have a time lapse film of her doing the, going back and forth. Just anyways, just a thought. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that is a great thought. We'll see if we can accom accommodate that next time. Uh, and then public works, for example. Public works actually starts from here, in this office upstairs, and goes to development service to actually get their plan reviews and brings them back. And so we took a, a count of steps. So that's about 700 steps, round trip. It takes about eight minutes. And so if you did it over the course of a year, that's 182,000 steps. Uh, it takes about 36 hours over the course of a year or 86 miles and just walking back and forth just to get developed. And plans. I actually talked to Mr. McDaniel about the possibility, the thought of moving everything together, mm -hmm. maybe in your university area or something like that, which he's, to which he said no. <laughs> well, I think with... I think with one of the proposals that you're going to see, there, we're, we're pretty much going to eliminate all the walking and driving. You're, by software. By That's software. That's what we're building to, I see. Yes, because the Mary next Ann's day. going to get really overweight. <laughs> <laughs> She's got other job duties that keep her walking around. Uh, but on this page here, you can see this is uh, the fire marshal's office. Uh, they're driving from a fire admin all the way to City Hall and back. And so we were able to calculate based on the numbers here is that roughly it's about 12 minutes in time, uh, about six miles, and we converted that over to annual numbers. You're looking at 52 hours or 1,456 miles in a given year that, that the fire marshal is driving back and forth just to get plans. So with that being said, we went back and said, okay, let's look at this process. How do we want it to function? If we were to able to get the perfect software how would this process look? And so we're able to look at the process, and this is the new process map that we developed. We're able to have now 22 steps versus the, the 32 steps. Uh, so we took that approximately about 10 steps out of the process to try to make this a lot more efficient. This is, of course, going to a more electronic method, not a manual method. Because right now, you have developers that bring in their plans versus why don't we just submit it electronically? You know, just bring it in. Uh, you don't even have to bring it in. You can actually just do it from, all, from your home. Uh, you can go online, uh, submit the application, submit your plans, gets received, and then we deploy it uh, electronically, all instantaneously versus the manual process that Does that exists. require the development people, because I know we're kind of skipping to the end here because I looked at it, but does that require the developer to have software? No. No, no ma'am. We would provide all that, and I'll talk about the softwares that we have in a minute. Uh, but I want to give you a comparison of what we currently have and what we're proposing to get here in the future. So for example, right now, oh, this is the difference between the two uh, process maps, just so that you can see the visual differences in, in how many steps uh, were eliminated. <clears throat> so right now, we currently have a software called ENCODE 8, is, which is our financial software as well. Uh, which is ENCODE 10. But ENCODE 8 has several issues that we have that prevent us from being more efficient at this point in time. In other words, having that electronic methodology versus the, the manual process. Well, for the first one is that it's very limited in the sense that Tyler Technologies, who is the owner of this software, is really trying to push everybody into what's called Intergov, okay, which is a software we analyze as well. But everybody's trying to, uh, 
Tyler Technologies is trying to push everybody away from ENCODE 8. They're not doing support. Uh, well, they're still doing support for it, but at a certain point in time, they're not going to do support for it anymore. They're not doing any updates to it anymore, so they're not. So that's why I said they're trying to push everybody to it. So we've had ENCODE 8 for how long? Uh, since 2008. And then ENCODE 8 has a, a limited web interface. So at this point in time, the way it happens, uh, and actually we don't even have it open as a functionality uh, for developers at this time, this is very cumbersome. To get access to the website, you have to submit an application. That application then has to be found in ENCODE 8 because it doesn't give you a pop-up that says, hey, you have a new application for some developer that wants to be part of the system. So you have to go to, you have to find it within ENCODE 8. Then you have to give access to them, and then they have to go over there and say, okay, well now I can put all my information in. However, you can't do uh, like the payment schedules or, or the fees properly because there's a glitch in the system that doesn't allow you to calculate certain things properly. So they still have to come in manually to process all their fees. But the one thing that it does do once you have it all is that it, does, it will give you a status as to where your plan is in the review process itself. But that's the limit of the process itself. If that, you're uh, able to do all the other things. In it. Yes. And how many of the, the permits or how many of the plans do you think have taken advantage of that? Well, we haven't opened it up to anybody in, in the system because it's so cumbersome just to get through it uh, for the developers, so we don't have any developers that use it. Department wise, uh, engineering, fire, uh, of course, development services all have access to ENCODE 8 itself. So the uh, developers the not been able to go online and find out where they are in the process. No, ma'am. But our internal operations could, so that if there are queries right now from the developer, they could. Well, they would have to, so they can't go on, on the website, like through our, uh, if you go to curvilletexas.gov, you can't go through there. Yeah. And so you'd go to ENCODE 8, and you have to kind of massage it to get the information out to see where the status is. So, so it's clunky. Yeah, it's and very so clunky. It, yeah. It's not really user friendly, and that's why it's not been put out there for folks to use. Yeah, I understand. But internally, we can. If somebody would call in and say, Where are we on the process? And you go click, click in your encode and say, Here we are. I don't think so. You, I think, you, it, I think you it's might very part of the story, but yeah. there's a lot of other things that maybe somebody hasn't put their data in because they're using a manual process mm -hmm. to. To supplement the electronic. Process. Usually, what happens is at the end of the process, when everybody's done mm -hmm. uh, doing their plan reviews, that's when the information is actually putting in, being put into ENCODE. At that point in time, um, it's not done uh, as like let's say uh, Kyle, uh, for example, it's not like he's on the engineer in the engineering, then going in there and updating the information because you have to first of all find it, and then you have to go to your section. And then there's a lot of different process manual steps you have to do. And then you don't have access. Uh, well, there's limited amount of information you can put in it anyway. So it's like, I think, less than 200 characters that you can put in just for information. And so there's very limiting to what you can do. So it's just better to wait till the end process and then do it all at that point in time. And even then, you're just documenting dates. You're not documenting the information that came from the departments. You're documenting that through a Word document that's then uh, being sent out to the, the consultant or the cons uh, contractors and developers. So this is, this is basically the big reason why the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing half yes, the sir. time, right? So okay. have we been paying an annual fee like this new one is asking, I mean, uh, for the yes. software we have for all these years and yes. maybe we haven't even utilized it, huh? Yes. Not to its full capacity. Yeah, not to full its we capacity. Do, we do as far as the final wrap up as the status of it so that we, we can inquire about, you know, some history on some. Looking back. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. so how much is that annual fee? Uh, I don't recall. It's part time. of a complete package on ENCODE. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the problem is going to be, like you say, Tyler is going to, is stopping supporting it, correct? Right. Eventually. Yeah. So, like, yeah. Like yeah. Pub and everybody. And does Tyler own Intergov? What yes. is it? Okay. So Tyler, Tyler Technologies owns Intergov. And that's why I said, you know, within the next maybe five years, they're pretty much going to drop in code eight and then really push everybody into that in, uh, inner gov. Okay. So we're already, you know, we're going to face that eventually. Right. Uh, so some potential improvements that we've identified is one, 
we would love to be able to have a software that allows us to receive the applicant applications for permits online. Uh, we can assign and track the work electronically. Uh, we also, by doing that, we're hoping to improve our internal communications. And then, of course, review plans virtually, re basically reducing uh, the paper within the department. Doesn't mean we eliminate all paper, but we go paper light. Uh, and then communicate to the customers electronically and online so that they have the information available to them so that they can see the status of where they're at and where they're, where they're going. <clears throat> so here are the different uh, uh, systems that we've looked at. Uh, so this is kind of giving you a a la carte menu, per se, so that you can see the different services or the different, different uh, functions that we're looking to have with forever system, every system that we look at. So those are all on the left-hand side. So you'll see like ePortal, the mobile application, the permitting, the planning, and so forth. So you can see in code eight, we have limited ePortal. We, ha we can't do electronic plan submissions. Uh, no mobile application, no GIS capability, uh, and so forth all the way down the line. And then when you look at Intergov, iWorks and CityWorks, they can all have the same functionality. The biggest difference is price, of course. So at this point, the estimated price for like, let's say, Intergov, just for the initial installment is the 83,160, and then after that, it's a yearly maintenance of 7,000. iWorks is 29,200, and then a yearly maintenance of 17,500. And then you have CityWorks, which is 100,000, and then a yearly maintenance of 20,000. Now with CityWorks, so they do it by the plan, correct? Yeah. So they, so that, that's how they increase their fee structure. So the more plans you do, the more they increase the cost. And for iWorks itself, the cost structure is based off of population. And, and Drew will get more in detail with that as we go forward. So, For how many years is that? I mean, could you sign that up for, you know, a yearly maintenance for five years or ten years, mm -hmm. or what is that good for? Yes, ma'am, you could do that any, any situation price. we wanted to. But the, according to, like, iWork, for example, the price only increases if we pass a certain population threshold. And I don't know what that difference is. I don't know. Looking at comparison of these under a five-year time frame, of course, ENCODE 8 is part of our Tyler Technologies with our finance software. Um, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, InterGov, uh, we've approximated the 2% increase just based on inflation. iWork, again, is a fixed fee based on population. CityWorks, we've estimated a fixed fee, but again, that will fluctuate based on the number of permits and fees that we charge. Um, so as we get an increase in permits, that fee will go up. Um, but without being able to estimate that, you can see in a five-year time frame what those different costs come out to. Intergov, approximately 115000 iWorks, just under 100000 and CityWorks, upwards of 180000 as we've been going through our review process, or reviewing our processes, uh, you can see on the right-hand side, the Greenbelt project has actually already looked at several of the customer attributes that we found through the Kano analysis. Just reviewing development services overall, we've touched several more. Um, software update picks up at least seven of those, many of them being that more is, more is better category. Uh, for what the develop the stakeholder group had identified as the attributes that they want to see out of our process. <coughs> what, how come it, it isn't providing timelines of the process <coughs> on the software update? I'm sorry? You know, we're on number ten, 10, is that, when you have the X, that'll, that's what it will provide, right? Yes. Okay, so why wouldn't it provide uh, timelines of the process as well? As far as implementation? Yeah. Um, that's actually next steps, which is a next slide or two. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry, th this is just the comparing the processes we've reviewed as it relates to the stakeholder attributes that they've identified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So next steps, looking at the implementation of a new software to reach some of those customer attributes refine our processes to fit in with that software. So rather than take our current process and just digitize it, I think that's kind of where we got to in ENCODE 8. We didn't amend the process when we went to a software program. We just took the existing process and 
added the computer in, into it. With the new implementation, we'd actually work with the software company to look at best practices for this process because although Kerrville is unique, the building permit development process is fairly similar across the state. Uh, so we have talked with the different companies that we're considering. They will kind of guide us through best practices that they've seen and then amend our process to fit that. Okay, that, that actually was one of my questions. So, um, I mean, looking at software on a price basis is great, but are we doing a lot of funneling our processes to fit the software, or did we go search for software that fit the process we would like? Do you know what I'm saying? The latter. The latter. The latter. So we would, we would look at what are our needs of the process, both internally and externally. That's why okay. we had that stakeholder group. Um, what, which of those software better fits our needs? Uh, for example, the inspections in the field being digital. So inspectors having access to a tablet or a laptop do the inspection and email you a, a final inspection report before they leave the job site. Or if there are conditions, I mean, they can document all of that. Rather than duplicating the work, taking yeah. notes in the field, going back to the office, typing it up, saving it into an existing software, and then the customer still doesn't see that till the end of the process. Right. Um, so having that access to the information, both internally and externally, uh, that's one of the key factors that we're looking at between the different software companies. Uh, but overall, reviewing those processes, that process map that we looked at, which fits the, which company or software fits our process, and where do they recommend that we make adjustments and changes to get rid of some of that duplication. Also looking at evaluating the DRC or the um, Development Review Committee. Uh, it's a committee that comes together for the projects to kind of go through a due diligence process, uh, both with the builder, contractor, or owner, um, some city staff, and external departments and utility companies. Just reviewing how that process fits in within the permitting process. And then of course with the software and hardware implementation to improve the inspection process. To get your question, Mayor, as far as timeline, one of the things that we're in the process of doing with staff is we're developing our budget proposals for next fiscal year. So this is something that they're contemplating that might be a proposal in their budget for sure. y'all to, to consider. Yeah, I assume that's what this was about. Did you, is this your homework, uh, these uh, companies here, these software options, or would you go out for an RFP or? It's, is it pretty limited, the number of software companies? Is, is this I, your own assignment here? I think charvi has been very involved mm -hmm. with okay. Guillermo and Drew, and, okay. um, and so ultimately we would probably do an RFP, mm -hmm. but we're just identifying the universe of folks yeah. that might work for us right now. Yeah, There's give you a picture of sure. around here. We yeah. also have an opportunity to go through buy board or some other mechanism, but, you know, regular governmental purchasing processes. And, and just to see. Suggestion: the the one that showed the prices of the different ones. Mm -hmm. If we just stretch that out to year seven, then that shows us as Intergov being right. the cheapest one, right? That's correct. So if we're going to try and sell us on Intergov, we might want to do that. Yeah. Show us where that it actually hits the break even. Yeah, and this was just you know? preliminary numbers just yeah. to see how they played out. Um, obviously, cost is a part of that evaluation factor, yeah. but I think the Cause aside from cost how these fit our processes yeah. and the benefits we get from it are gonna be more important. I mean, so it's, it, Intergov is, is a separate piece or is it a module of Tyler? It is a separate piece. Okay. Does it have any, I mean, is there a need even? Do they have to interface at all or is it ever? It'd be nice like with the financials so that when, we'll have to build some sort of bridge. Mm -hmm. I work with Tyler my own self, so just in, you know, and I do that. Ah. So just so you know. Cheap fix. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually what, you know, anyways. And that's one of those questions we have been asking all the people is that do they have that bridge or capability yeah. of inter, inter, yeah. interfacing with Incotent? Well, as far as addressing um, redundancy within, you know, like we mentioned earlier, someone is out and it, it, for two weeks. How do we address that? Or how are you addressing that? Reviewing that at, at just a staff level. Um, obviously, if we have one person that has that job and they are out of town, we don't have a backup in every position. Uh, but without doing
duplicating our entire staff, there's going to be some need to review how that functions. Uh, but again, having digital access versus paper access, if there is someone that can be either cross-trained or something to that extent, they would have access to that at the time. Yeah, the other thing too that we're working on over there is um, roles and responsibilities of specific staff members. And so the new building official comes on board Monday and um, there's been some shuffling of roles and duties with uh, different staff members to try to streamline as well as have some redundancy. And so that's definitely top of mind as, as we kind of work through. There's no point in fixing the process if nobody's there to do the work. And I know one of the things you, you said about this new position, one of the um, looks like recommendations was conduct all plan review in house. That was an excitement category. That would be great if we could. And I think we may be looking at doing a little more of that. This right. Is what you said. Uh, yes, ma'am. And so there's that. And I, th I think that we would still want to retain a third party review just if, if we got really swamped and we had a big commercial outfit come in and they're going to need you know, a higher level of service. Uh, we'd want to have that just as a backup. How much are we sending out? What are we, are we doing everything? No. Go ahead and comment on Currently with no building official, um, the commercial plans have been going out to the third party. Residential plans have been reviewed in-house. Um, again, the, the focus is to go majority in-house um, as soon as we can get there just to increase that consistency. But with missing staff members, that's, that has been a concern and an issue. I also had a question about um, the comment, um, inspectors provide solutions to construction. Could you comment on that? Not much detail. Uh, that did come from the stakeholder group. I think where that's coming from is when there is an issue on the job site of how something was constructed versus what it was designed in the plans. Is the inspector qualified to make that determination or give recommendations without having to stop work, go back to the drawing board or architect or engineer, confirm that it is appropriate and then go back out in the field and continue work. Um, and that's just going to be case by case. And some examples that will be a possibility, others that it would have to go back to the professional. Isn't that one essentially what happened in Florida recently when the bridge broke? That I'm not sure. Because I, I think what I read about it, the, the inspectors were looking at something, and, and while they were looking at it, the bridge broke. Because they were running some tests of some kind. Okay. I, I don't. I certainly don't know a great depth. Of, you know, have great depth of knowledge. But it was an interesting thing to to go to the local newspaper, and they had a lot more about it than you see on the television news at five o'clock or whatever. Right. So yeah, I don't know what the poli what our policy is. I understand liability issues. <coughs> I mean, that makes sense. But if there was something simple that you know you could say, you know reverse this or you know if you just look at right uh, yeah years ago we did that and it was very helpful when Sonny Caulfield was in office well I think I'm encouraged from what I see so far from our our new building official through our interviews and his responses to some of his questions and how he operates he comes from the private sector and then he worked in the government sector as far as building officials he's got a lot of credentials so I think he's going to have capability as the building official to make a lot of those calls where right now I think there's a tendency to just not make them because nobody wants to be responsible and accountable for doing something different. And he's confident enough in his abilities that, that I think he can do that. That'll, you know, we'll certainly coach in that direction, but he, he has a tendency already to kind of operate that way. So I'm curious about all staff members are prepared, uh, prepared before development review committee. I mean, I would think that would be un understood that right. we're all going to be prepared. Does that mean they just didn't get the information in time? Is that part of the issue there? S some of that. Um, either didn't get the information or have not had time to review it based on other job duties. Um, depending upon what the project is, the level of detail in the project, obviously each person looks at that as a different priority. I would have um, thought that would be in the must category. Exactly. Must. I mean, <laughs> I'd put it in the must. I guess it's because of the mix of people that you had there who may not have understood or been ever before in the process. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, this, again, the stakeholders 
we're a mixed group. Some yep. of them have never gone through that process. Um, some of them, if there is a staff member that is unable to attend, they've already addressed it beforehand or follow up afterwards. So there's, there's still a lot of communication outside of the DRC um, to make up for those gaps. Uh, but that was something that they did talk about. Yeah, I mean, if we were gonna be calling things must haves, that's one in particular and high level of customer service at all levels, that's not more, that's a must have. I don't care what they said. I mean, that, that I mean. We, we've also done the study in house to see how it kind of compares just with the development services staff. Um, so it's, it's been neat to compare the two of them. Um, hit a lot of the same attributes, but yeah. to your point, a lot of their more and excitement are what we consider must yeah. have they're working on. So. Sure. And wh why is um, all decision makers attend DRC? That's not. I mean, it's a must-have, but it doesn't, it's not being addressed by any of our three. What's, what's that mean? Does that just mean somebody's gonna say it's gonna happen and so we don't need to use these to do that? The Development Review Committee has limited approval for the site plan process. Uh -huh. um, some of the other pieces that have come to the DRC, whether it's plats or pre-development, um, multiple ideas on a project rather than one concise project, there's a lot of things at that point that we can't approve that so it's kind of a um, gray area the, the DRC only has so much area that they can approve without having to go through into the full building permit process or back to planning and zoning or zoning board of adjustment uh, just as a few examples so I guess to my experience you're saying all decision makers should not attend I think they should attend no, I'm not saying they shouldn't. Okay. They There's can't? a lot of examples where they can't be there because okay. it's not actually the DRC that's making that recommendation or approval. So it's, like I said, it's it's kind of gray as far as what goes to DRC, and so that's why we're evaluating that process. I would think that the in the software program, and I know this will be another conversation later down as we get in budget and all of that, I mean, that makes sense to me um, to streamline that digitally, um, but wouldn't it seem like it would improve a lot of things in that last list? Yes. It, it would. The list that we have checked are specific questions we've asked the software company. I see. Um, I mean, obviously looking at, um, I had a couple keyed in there, but as far as the timeline of the process, right. we've asked for internal, do we have some, um, back to my list there. For example, we've looked at the task management side so that we can see where some of those projects are. Um, what's, where's the slowdown point? What's the hold up on a particular project? But we haven't applied that to the outside as well. I and mean, it's a, a different evaluation. So you're right, it, it will touch a lot more of these attributes than just the ones we've checked. The ones we've checked are the ones that we specifically looked at as far as the opportunities with the software. You know, something else that we haven't really talked about yet is, you know, I know we, we all have one-on-one, -on -one, but the need to update our codes, right? So whether that's the subdivision code or the zoning code, or maybe it's a, uh, an ancillary code that impacts the development process, like signs or what have you, sidewalks. So there's a, you know, one of the things I've asked them to do is come back with a budget proposal also for the rewrite of the code to support whatever we end up with on Kerrville 2050. And so it'd be a pretty comprehensive rewrite. And uh, so they're, they're working on that as a budget proposal and you'll see that in uh, your budget process coming up. What was the feedback from the stakeholders on the zoning on that particular issue? Did it come up? Yes, um, I don't remember how we documented that. One second. Uh, if you look back at this table here, Page number 16, oh. rewrite or make clear the rules, codes, and ordinances. It's kind of a generic point. Um, but to that, the zoning code, the subdivision regulations, and the stakeholder group didn't pinpoint each piece, but just that that is. Um, updating the building code, sidewalk falls into that category that we've already started our discussions on. Here, here is one of the biggest comments that we've had for 15 years, and that's I, uh, from developers. I get to um, the job site, I got a permit to go forward, and then a week later I'm into the process and something comes back and I have to change something. 
and a correction two, three, four times. It's a moving uh, target. Yeah. And so uh, I see on, on this chart on page 11 that you have detailed checklists for permits. I know we have that currently, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. These things seem to kind of be, uh, as Vocal said, a, a moving target sometimes. So is there, in this software, uh, adaptability, or is there an absolute? There is, you're mm -hmm. nodding your head. So we have, we can build in what we think is necessary, and everybody will know that up front. Okay. Yes. As you can see on our, on the slide that we have up here, number two, um, is at the top of the more list. And the Greenbelt project that Trina's been working on has looked at that specifically. Um, and we have looked at that as far as our software implementation as well. Yeah, so that's something that I'm glad you brought up, Mayor, because it's one of those <coughs> nuance of, of, of one of the benef big benefits of the software is that even if staff changes over time, all that's built in. So the new staff coming in is working with the same system, the checklist, the you know, the process is the same. And, and so more consistency. If you change your zoning and your codes and those kinds of things, that's gonna change the process and you can change it on here, right? Mm -hmm. You can adapt it to whatever's approved. Yes. Are you saying we're the moving target right now is because of the software? Because there's a lot of mean? inconsistencies that are happening. I, just in my experience, there's a moving target. We come to staff, come to DRC, we do the checklist, we come back, things have changed. Is that because of the software or is that because of different problems? A combination of things. I mean, once you get into permitting, it's definitely being able to track what has occurred in the past. Um, the inconsistencies within our code that we have talked about are another part of it. Um, some of the areas of interpretation, some of the areas that are, you know, one, one ordinance has it spelled out one way, another piece has it a different way. So that's just cleaning up the codes and interpretations of those codes? Can council do that? Yeah, so that, absolutely. So that's the follow-on process that I mentioned for after we, we'll go ahead and go through the budget process and, and uh, pitch a proposal to uh, ask somebody to come in and help rewrite our code so that we'll be make sure that we're looking at not just what makes sense for Kerrville, but looking at best practices and industry standards and so forth. and. Um, you know, that's something that will go, have to go through P&Z and ultimately the council will have to uh, weigh in on and approve. I know one of them is vacating parts a lot. I think Drew's aware of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done that for a long time and now we're being told that might not be correct, but City Hall property vacated parts a lot. If you look at the title of the plat, it is parts of lots, so whatever they are. But I don't know why this has come, with, what, why, why are we at where we're at? Why, why are we saying that now we can't vacate parts lots? Previous interpretations of the code versus uh, current interpretations. So okay, that's that's actually the the point, and you guys have talked about two of the items on here. One's one's a must-have by the stakeholders, and one's a more, <coughs> but they're really the same thing. The rewrite or make clear rules, codes, and ordinances really rolls up under consistency among staff. So if if the must have is consistency among staff, with all due respect, I'd just assume not wait a year to get a review mm -hmm. of the codes and ordinances. I'd rather us give staff the, the ability to be consistent by getting rid of these variances and bad interpretations or, misinter or multiple interpretations, whatever it is, right. as they come forward. We're not having, a, we're not having to go review everything that's on the books, but as they're presented, and they're presented repeatedly, we should be addressing those interpretations that are inconsistent, mm -hmm. and those are happening constantly, because we're hearing that, I'm sure you are. Right. So to me, that's like the biggest thing on here, is, is that consistency, and um, you know, the, the, you mentioned turnover, Turnover becomes a non-factor if we have policies, policies that are consistent. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I agree. That's a long, long process. It's necessary. We've needed it a long time. The Zoic uh, committee has rules that have been sitting, uh, gathering dust for two years. Uh, their recommendation for zoning, and so it's been a need for a long, long time to be consistent. But 
that's a long process. I would estimate by the time you budget and you approve and you contract and they finish, you're a year and a half down the road. Well, if there if there's some items that are specific, and uh, Councilman Broody and I've had this discussion where you you feel like that we just can't wait on this item. We we have an idea what those might be, but I'd rather have you all tell us, and you know we can cherry pick a few and see what it make if it makes sense. It's there's a ripple effect of everything that you do, and it's all got to fit together, and that's why a rewrite of the entire code at one time is essential, as opposed to you know amending it over here and it's not consistent with what's over here, and so on and so forth. So, if if, if y'all have some specific policy types of issues that you feel like that we need to fix, then we'd be glad to take a look at those and give you some recommendations. One thing okay. we we don't have, I'm, I'm assuming we don't have, is a feedback mechanism from people who have been through the process to give us a feedback. And obviously a lot of times developers don't want to do that because they have to work with us. Mm -hmm. And so I understand the difficulties. We at one time had a fellow here in town do an independent review and he, he called every permit puller for the last six months to a year and got feedback privately, confidentially and found there was there were issues you know that long ago with consistency mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing so i don't know any place you've been if you have a mechanism for that kind of thing that's mm -hmm. confidential and right. people feel like they could be um, well, forthcoming about i was going to i was going to add to this to your, to your comment is that part of the business plans that we have all the departments doing there is an element in there that's focused on the customer themselves mm -hmm. And so part of that may be developing some type of customer surveys. Uh, how that gets deployed is a, is, is, a, is a question that needs to be answered. But there are elements within the business plans that ask you, how are you listening to your customer? What are you doing to gather your customer requirements? And then how are you developing processes to meet those requirements? So there's a lot of things within our business plans that can help us with that. Is there something in there that addresses, if we've, if we've got codes that are very explicit, say don't do this. Well, that's, that's a roadblock to the developer, they all know what it is. If, if to, what I'm hearing is that too many times we have interpretations of the code that are being utilized to essentially be another hurdle for a developer. If it doesn't explicitly prohibit it, why would we interpret it in a way that prevents development? Are we, why, why do we do like that? Aren't we development friendly? I guess. Yeah, Blame but it's, it, but, but like I say, it's, it's not it's not so much just saying all rules aside, let them do whatever. But if it doesn't explicitly prohibit it, why are we interpreting our prohibition into it? Well, I think we'd have to look at the specific example because that again it gets down to an interpretation of of what, how you're viewing it, and and so that's why I'd like to look at specific items um, on a case by case basis. And you have yeah. some, Ronnie, that you can visit with him about? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a list. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think right now as we're, we're in this development process, I know you're reorganizing and you've done well to, to go through this, and we appreciate that because this is something that we brought to Mr. McDaniel's attention when he first came in, and this is something that you all have been working on internally because we're trying to build a comprehensive plan. We're doing these studies to find out where does retail go, where does this go, where does the hotel. And we have to know when people come in, I don't want to hear one more developer call me and say, I don't want to build in Kerrville anymore, or I don't want to do architectural services in Kerrville anymore, and I've heard it recently. And you know that's the kind of thing we're trying to eliminate. Mm -hmm. We don't want to overlook rules. You have to have rules. Uh, it's important to your neighbors and everyone around you. It's important for safety and a number of reasons, traffic and all of that. But we want the customer to know that once he has a plan approved, he can or she can confidently go into this, not worrying about being stopped down the line and having to gather thirty or forty thousand dollars more to start over or correct something that's just been brought to their attention. That's as plain as I know how to put it. And so uh, maybe Mr. Vogel has some specifics. Maybe Mr. Broody does as well. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm all for the software updates. I think that's very important, as in every other aspect of the government work. Um, you know, it will, it will save some of the time. Mm -hmm. But then there's just some policy things. 
um, like was mentioned, the consistency things that um, if, if somebody can't afford to build here, that's the way it is. But we want them to know that they know everything going in that they're going to need and feel like they've had a great experience, whether they can do it or not, when they leave. Yeah, I can't overemphasize the, the um, request of the council on my part and the staff's part for your support on the rewrite of the codes because, you know, I think what we've been limping along and doing workarounds and, you know, it means this, it means that, and we just need clarity. We all need clarity. Sure. And so I think sh shining the light, so to speak, on what it all really means and, and being very clear about what the rules are um, is – is really what we need more than anything else. So I look forward to our budget discussions on that and hopefully we can move sooner rather than later. Sure. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? I appreciate y'all having this stakeholder uh, meeting and uh, you know getting feedback and, and paying attention to these requests. That's a good first step in my mind. This is, and the software uh, research, that's another good step towards elimination of some of these issues. Mr. Ferguson, did you have any comments? You've been quiet down there. Yes, no. <laughs> I understand what's going on here. I mean, okay. It's, it's a challenge uh, that we need to be better at, and we, and, and we need to get to where we can let customers look in and see where their piece of, where their work is. I think that, that goes a long way to satisfy customers is let them know where things are, even if they want to call up and say, well, you're late. But it's better to tell them than to not tell them. Sure. And then they find out another week later, and that kind of thing. It, it, it's a challenge and uh, one that Kerrville's got to learn how to deal with a little better than they have been as we grow faster than we have been. So it's part of growth. Comments or questions? Um, any other input from staff? No. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Very good. Very informative. And uh, we look forward to where we go from here. And so we will adjourn at 11.02. Thank you.